We're exploring the unique world of Red Bull, the energy drink company that dominates Formula One and owns five soccer teams. Plus, Illinois is not impressed with the Chicago Bears stadium proposal and the Mariners added to their ownership group for the first time in a long time. It's Friday, May 3rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. As you'll recall, the Chicago Bears want $2.3 billion in public funds for their new stadium. They have support from the mayor of Chicago, but they are very far from having the support of the governor's office. In response to the proposal, Governor J.B. Pritzker's press secretary said, The current proposal is a non-starter for the state. In order to subsidize a brand new stadium for a privately owned sports team, the governor would need to see a demonstrable and tangible benefit to the taxpayers of Illinois. The Bears had every incentive to come out with a big first ask because the initial proposal puts a ceiling on what you can get, but the language out of the governor's office here is still striking. We are seeing a changing in norms around public funding for stadiums, first in public votes denying requests for an NHL arena in Tempe and funding for the Royals and Chiefs in Kansas City, and now we're seeing it from elected officials in Virginia and now Illinois. The governor's office is still talking to the Bears, and they're still open to a deal, but that deal might look a lot different from the ones we've seen in the past. The Seattle Mariners welcomed some new faces to its ownership group. Microsoft Vice Chair and President Brad Smith and his wife, Kathy Sura Smith, an executive at Nanostring Technologies, bought a stake in the team. No indication at the moment that this augurs any kind of bigger change among the team ownership group. The Mariners have been owned by John Stanton since 2016, who bought the team from Nintendo of America CEO Howard Lincoln. Nintendo retained a 10% share of the team in the sale. Ken Griffey Jr. bought a slice in 2021. Other than that, things have been quiet when it comes to Mariners team ownership. That said, it's not a bad time to cash in. The Mariners were valued at $2.2 billion by Forbes with an operating income of $76 million last year, second in baseball to only the Baltimore Orioles. Much of the league is figuring out how to handle its local broadcast going forward, but as that picture comes into focus, we may see other teams like the Nationals, Diamondbacks, Angels, and for different reasons, maybe the A's go on the market. I am joined now by the commercial director at Red Bull Racing and Red Bull Technology, Nick Stocker. Welcome, Nick. Hi, Owen. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So Red Bull has been the dominant team in F1 for the last few years. What has that meant for you on the commercial side? I mean, it's been fantastic for us as a commercial entity. Um, Obviously, Red Bull are a very strong commercial entity in themselves and Red Bull Racing in particular. But um, obviously, with the more success you have on the track, the more attraction you have from brands around the world wanting to affiliate themselves with you and your success. But um, For for our standpoint, it's been incredibly strong. I mean, for the last few years, we've grown our revenues uh, from the standpoint of of partnerships, but also grown our revenues from new areas within the team. So F1 Academy, uh, licensing, esports and the like. So, you know, all in all, it's been incredibly successful over the last few years from a from a commercial revenue standpoint. And I'm curious about the trajectory of that, both in terms of the amount of interest and which sorts of companies want to work with you, because in 2021, you know, Max Verstappen one on the the final lap of the, the entire season in a you know, somewhat controversial fashion um in 2022 you were you know, won fairly comfortably 2023 utter domination uh things are probably headed that direction this season as well um has that changed yeah both the amount of interest but also who's interested I think so, yeah. I mean, on the track obviously has a huge influence as to what happens off the track from a commercial standpoint. Um, But actually, we've been very proactive in targeting specific territories. Um, That success has obviously brought new interest from brands who haven't been interested in the sport before. Um, We've seen a whole host of things happening from, you know, a new generation of young drivers coming through with Max and Charles Leclerc and Lando Norris. Uh, Netflix obviously has been incredible for us. and, and we've also seen, of course, you know, the advent of new races in new territories. We've got now got three fantastic and high profile races in the US. And, and that's all helped us hugely. But actually, we've also been planning for this behind the scenes as well for a long time. So um, the plan for us has always been to put the fan at the center of everything we do as a team. You know, that's the whole mantra of Red Bull, you know, giving wings to people and ideas. And we're following that through with everything we do. So, um, you know, whilst there has been sort of these external factors which have grown the sport, actually the the other factors that we've put in, put in place, you know, working with people like our title partner, Oracle, who have helped us be a faster car on the track, but also have helped us engage with our fans off the track. So, you know, a few things that we've been putting in place over the last few years, obviously a program of show runs, 
um, where we take a car to an inner city uh, centre and give Formula One to the fans who perhaps can't afford to go to the track or perhaps aren't geographically placed to go to a Grand Prix. We have a we have a, a huge um, loyalty program we've set up with Oracle, um, and we're growing our um, our licensing. Um, division as well so it gives fans an opportunity to to sort of be part and own uh, something to do with the team so you know there's been a whole myriad of things that have been happening both things that we we haven't been able to control but have been contributing factors and then those things that are, are about us targeting a specific territory and the US is that market that we've been targeting over the last few years um, including the, uh, the launch of the car last year for the first Formula One car to be launched in, in New York. So, you know, it's been a, a, an incredible journey and um, the success on the track has obviously been an influence there as well. Yeah, and so, right, you've got, you're working with Oracle, now a US brand, are you the, the your naming partner? Um, Ford um, is coming in as an engine partner, you know, that obviously has more to do than just the, the American-ness of them. Um, are there other geographic regions that have been that have become more prominent for you in recent years, especially as, as F1 has become sort of a more global phenomenon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we've been slowly sort of taken over, um, uh, taken over sort of the world of Formula One um, over the last few years. And um, we're now the sort of the number one team in Australia, in Germany, in the Netherlands, you know, the most loved team in the US. So we're slowly sort of becoming the most loved team across the board in all of those territories. But the big focus for us has really been in the US. As I said before, we launched the car last year um, in New York. Um, a lot of our activations have been happening uh, across the US. We've been, uh, we have energy stations, which are our sort of unique hospitality on top of the Paddock Club hospitality at the three Grand Prix. Um, and and it's 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 been a target territory for us. And as a result of that, you know, we've had some huge wins from uh, from commercial partners joining the team as well. I mean, most notable there is obviously Oracle. Um, but you look at perhaps our, I mean, perhaps our, our, our biggest competitor over the last five years, you know, Mercedes, for example, um, they don't have any big US tech partners. So you can see how success doesn't necessarily bring in those big partners. Um, we've focused very hard on, on, on tech and we've focused very hard on US brands and it's been incredibly successful for us. So um, that's the target at the moment. But but I think moving forward, we're looking at other territories as well. I mean, Brazil is a huge territory for us. You know, we have the, the most popular driver in in uh, in South America with with Sergio Perez. Um, and of course, we you know, we we want to to use that popularity to drive fandom um, and engagement with fans within the world of Formula One and for us to be that number one choice of team for them. So Brazil is a big territory for us as is the middle east um you know there's a lot happening in the middle east at the moment um, we have four grand prix there at the moment and um and we have some enormous traction from the red bull brand as well so we we have a huge halo effect um of, of the brand in the middle east so there's there's a lot there's a lot we've done but there's certainly a lot more to do as well and since you mentioned brazil red bull also has five soccer teams you know new york germany vienna and two in brazil do you interact with that end of the company as well yeah, we do. We do. I mean, um, uh, very much, um, very much. They are the same sort of uh, entity as us, I guess, in, in accordance to Red Bull. You know, we are a corporate project of Red Bull. Um, however, I think where we are a truly global project, some of the soccer teams are a bit more localized. You know, it's a lot more tribal with football. Um, but we work very closely with them. I mean, we're working with the with the uh, New York Rebels this weekend obviously there's a match on saturday uh, in miami so we're speaking to the the team and we have been speaking to the team for the last few months about how we can help celebrate our 20th anniversary in the sport to celebrate 20 years of racing so you'll see the shirts that they're wearing adorned with uh, with forever rebel which is our campaign this year um, around how we've sort of disrupted the world of motorsport so we do work very closely with them we've got some other plans happening as well with one of the other teams um, but we continue to work with the different Red Bull properties and cross-pollinate sport around the world. And I think that's the beauty of Red Bull, you know, more so than any other team who are, you know, predominantly OEMs or just motor, you know, just um, automobile manufacturers. You know, we, we, we have relevance across multiple facets of other sports, of fashion, of lifestyle, of music, and we can very legitimately operate in those spaces. So it makes sense for us to work closely with the other Red Bull projects as well. In terms of your your global image and, and in the U.S. as well, of course, how much of that is is tied to Max Verstappen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a fair question. I think Max epitomizes everything that that Rebel represents. You know, we we bet on him when he was young. He was seventeen years old when he first came into the world of, of, of Formula One. Um, we're the only uh, company to ever work with Max in Formula One. You know, he works for. Um, uh, for uh, for Toro Rosso, our uh, our other Red Bull team, and now is obviously at Red Bull Racing. So, 
we took a real punt with Max when he was younger, when he was 17 years old, put him into a Formula One car, which I don't think you see nowadays. Um, but he, he really embodies that sort of fighting spirit of the brand. Um, but I think, you know, it's probably fair to say that, you know, Max is part of a team. The team is the most important thing. And, you know, we've had Sebastian Vettel as a multiple world champion who's been here before. And I think anything that um, when we look at the individual too much and focus too much on the individual, it takes away from the team. But Max is a critical part. And at some point he'll retire, you know, when he's 35, when he's 40 years old. And of course, we'll be looking at um, other drivers as well. But um, I think on the young, the youth development part as well, you know, Red Bull, when, when we talk about the young drivers coming through, there was a moment uh, in the sport where 12 of the starting 20 on the grid um, were, had actually come through the Red Bull uh, Junior Academy. So we do, we do run with a lot of young drivers. We take a punt on them. Uh, we invest in talent. We invest in youth. And, and that's, again, that's all part of the, the embodiment of giving wings to people and ideas, which comes from the main Red Bull brand. So it sounds like, you know, if, if Max decides to take on other challenges, um, uh, you know, maybe in the next couple of years that obviously it won't be good for you, but you'll be ready um, for, uh, you know, for the next thing. Yeah, we're, we're always preparing for the sort of the next generation of talent, whether that be the drivers, whether that be sort of engineers or, or, or anything else within the business. Um, you know, we were a young business. Um, you know, we're, we're only uh, young in terms of a lot of the other uh, teams who are sort of 60, 70 years in the sport. So we're a lot more fluid. Um, we, uh, we have less things to tie us back. We're a bit more dis disruptive. Um, and that comes through with, with the succession plans that we have in place as well. I mean, when Christian first uh, came into the sport as team principal, you know, uh, 20 years ago, he was the youngest team principal by quite a long way. I think he was 36, 37 years old, um, you know, incredibly young uh, to be leading a Formula One team. And we've we've invested uh, very much in, in youth. Um, and that's what makes us different and separates us from our competitors in the sport. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that you're switching engine suppliers in 2026 from Honda to Ford. I feel like the engine supplier, you know, as Formula One has become more popular and people kind of know the details a little bit more, that's become um, not just, you know, uh, you know, a, a racing uh, factor, but also people are sort of interested in, you know, which engine is powering the best cars. Uh, how, how do you, on your end, work with, you know, your, your partners, but particularly the engine suppliers? Well, the Ford relationships are um, a very different one to the Honda relationships. So Honda are very much involved in the development of the, of the engine itself. Um, Red Bull have invested... Um, millions of dollars in creating their own engine at Red Bull uh, Ford powertrains. Um, we're the only other team apart from Ferrari to create the power unit and the chassis under one roof. Um, and, you know, from the sort of early origins of the brand of Red Bull, you know, which is essentially a sort of a functional, uh, a functional energy drink to come all the way through sort of 40 or so years later to be competing with the Leviathans of the sport with your Mercedes and your Ferrari and your McLarens and, and winning, you know, we've come a long way. But um, Ford are helping us um, with some of the components of the engine, but that's very much based on an engine that we're creating ourselves with our, our own young talent and the talent that we've procured from other teams who've seen a you know an incredible opportunity to do something amazing within the sport. So, from that standpoint, it's you know we're, we're building the engine ourselves with 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 some help from Ford. But um, what I would say about that is it's not just about the engine. Actually, we're building a huge new technology campus as well to support the growth of the business. Um, and you know we, we, we're a debt-free business. You know we're incredibly successful. You know the revenues coming into the team through you know through multiple areas and we're really setting ourselves up for the future this is going to be a dynasty within the sport rather than just success over a few a few years and yeah you mentioned red bull and ferrari are you know the two most vertically integrated teams also um the two most successful teams at the moment do you think we're going to see more of that vertical integration from other teams you know as as we move forward especially into 2026 when engine regulations change yeah, quite possibly. But I think that there also needs to be a level of investment there as well. You know, I think it's not it's not a cheap sport to be part of. You know, it's very expensive. There's a lot of development, a lot of highly talented individuals who are sort of best in class, you know, in, in the industry, whether that be engineering or sort of strategy or anything else. But um, there certainly has to be an investment there first. Um, I think what you'll probably see is, you know, hopefully the success from 26 onwards with the with the Oracle Rebel Racing team. You know, we may see people who will be wanting to purchase our engines from us rather than, you know, uh, going to the, the, the competitors, which at the moment is quite a, th a thin and small uh, list. Um, so maybe that's something that's going to happen first before we start seeing that sort of fully integrated uh, business model that both Ferrari and ourselves are adopting. Um, this might be slightly out, out of your purview, but I'm sort of, I've always been curious about that, uh, about F1 and how, you know, often, you know, 
one team will supply engines to three or four teams. Um, is there sort of like a, I mean, you're also competing against each other. So I'm just wondering it, how, how that all works. Like if, you know, um, you're, you're happy to supply if, you know, if the deal's right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I think the sport is full of contradictions. I mean, if you start with the drivers, first of all, you know, if you speak to the drivers, most commonly, you know, the first person who they want to be is their teammate, which is unlike any other sport in the world. Um, so it's, the sport is full of contradictions right from the very start. But um, I think you have to be careful, obviously, of who you're providing the uh, the engine to. I'm sure there's many lists that teams have of teams who they don't want to supply the engine to. Um, but um, over the last few years, we've sort of seen that settle quite a lot. There's been a few uh, teams who have got quite close alliances. Um, and um, they've, they've been playing out over the last five or six years. But I think 2026 is a real opportunity to, uh, to see a few changes within the sport. We've seen, obviously, Honda will be moving over to, to Aston Martin. We're going to be building our own engine. And I think you'll see a few other uh, impacts of that as a domino effect happens across the sport. Uh, fascinating stuff. Nick Stocker, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. Appreciate it. That's it for today. Subscribe wherever you like to tune in. Enjoy your weekend. Get outside. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.